the place where dreams come true. What we want to do is to give them a whole week where the answer to everything is yes. Meet a man who escaped death and now wants to help others do the same. We will not turn down a child, ever. And then her life was a mess. This is too much. No job, tons of bills. Food was uh, scarce in the house. How she turned her setback into a comeback. I had to pull the call, I was just so happy. Well, welcome, folks, to this edition of the 700 Club. We're glad to welcome a dear friend back from the snows of Kilimanjaro. <laughs> she survived. Wendy, you're here. I did what you told me to do, Pat. I stayed, stayed alive. alive. <laughs> well, a lot of us <laughs> prayed for you. We're going to hear a full story. You've got cameras. It was the hardest thing I have ever done. We have, I have video, and I can't wait to well, show it to you. They talk about the bucket list, things you're going to do before <laughs> you kick the bucket. You, you can mark one. You don't have Ooh, to do it done. again. All right. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I remember years and years ago when I was studying English literature, there was a poem by a guy named Goldsmith who talked about uh, the man who stole the goose off the common and who got arrested, but who arrested the man who stole the common from out of the goose? Well, we have such thieves at work in our society today, and I want to, we got an amazing story about it. But I, I, before I get into that story later on in this program, I just want to tell you, the scam about global warming is expensive. Now, here are the figures. From 2001 to 2014, the federal government spent $131 billion to fight climate change caused by humans, along with $176 billion in tax breaks. Now, the European Union plans to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. It would cost $100 billion by 2020. And all in all, uh, during this century, we will spend $7 trillion on what looks like a scam. Somebody is stealing the common from under the goose. <laughs> And you are the goose. So I'm going to tell you how they're trying to cook your goose. You don't want to miss it. And by the way, get out those long johns and those sweaters that Aunt Minnie gave you for so many uh, birthdays and stuff that you couldn't wear. Snow in the summer, frozen lakes in June. We may indeed be getting climate change, but not global warming. We've got global cooling in your future. The United Nations will meet next week and tell us once again that the Earth is heating up, even though the temperatures clearly show that it isn't. Dale Hurd has the story. It's already snowing, and one of America's premier weather forecasters is warning that for parts of the U.S., another bad winter is on the way. It's going to be a major winter for much of the eastern and southern part of the United States. We think it's a formidable winter, but the core of the worst cold uh, relative to averages, instead of being in the northern plains and Midwest, will be further south and east. Last winter was bad too, historically bad. The Great Lakes weren't ice free until June, when the Mountain West was still seeing snow. But the UN keeps warning us that if we don't do something to stop global warming, the end is near. The report confirms that the effects of human caused climate change are already widespread and consequential. But what effects from climate change? The Earth stopped warming 18 years ago, and the weather has made a mockery of climate change predictions. The number of extreme weather events are down, sea levels are not rising dangerously, and not only is Antarctic ice not melting, it's the largest it's been since measurements began 35 years ago. But world leaders, including our president, still act like climate change is a serious problem. Climate change is already affecting Americans all across the country, in every region, although in different ways. This is called a climate scream. It's similar to a primal scream, except it's done by radical environmentalists demanding world leaders do something to stop climate disaster. But the real disaster has been the inaccuracy of all those scary predictions that didn't come true. By last count, there were 42 separate explanations in the scientific or public literature on why it hasn't been warming, when there are 42 explanations for some one phenomenon, I can tell you what that means. Scientists don't know what they're talking about. There's a real problem with the computer models for climate change. Why has the Earth stopped warming? 
One reason, cooler surface temperatures in the Pacific. One of the major cycles of the Earth, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which is a temperature cycle in the North Pacific Ocean, it's gone into a cool phase about 2005. The sun has moved into a cool phase in terms of sunspots. Weatherbell's Joe Bistardi is forecasting a long-term trend toward colder temperatures. Over the next 20 to 30 years, I think the general trend is down back towards where it was in the late 70s. The 1970s was when some were warning of a coming ice age. Yet President Obama thinks the problem of global warming is so urgent, he's reportedly been plotting to make an international climate deal without gaining U.S. Senate approval as required by the Constitution. But the president may be lonely when he attends next week's climate summit in New York. A number of world leaders aren't coming. Perhaps they're afraid of looking silly. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Okay, there it is, ladies and gentlemen. They are the true facts. The Antarctic, the Antarctic has got more ice than they've ever had since we began taking measurements. It isn't melting, it is growing faster. And it's going to be one cold weather. I've seen one report that indicated maybe five times as much snow this year as we've had in the past. You see, what are they doing? Here's the game. These socialists and progressives, or whatever they're called, want to take control of the economy, the global economy. They want huge government to manipulate all that's being done. And so if they can scare people with this monstrosity to, uh, of, of climate change, they will have a, a chance to get more money. Now, we're talking about trillions of dollars that are going into this nonsense. And, uh, you know, people in colleges that don't go along with it, they aren't allowed to teach, they're not given promotions, they're not given tenure and so forth. But it's all a scam, ladies and gentlemen. It is in order to get control of the basic industries, get control of carbon, get control of coal, get control of oil and gas, fossil fuels and all the rest of it, so that they can dominate one other part of the economy. That's the game. Don't let them play it on you. But again, I said at the beginning of this program, the whole scheme uh, since the beginning of this um, century, $7 trillion in this fake science. You heard it here. Tell it others. Okay. In other news, once again, ISIS is threatening the United States with terrorism in the Middle East. And right here in America, John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. Here's John. That's right, Pat. ISIS terrorists have released a new video warning that its army in Iraq will strike back at the U.S. and its troops there. The video, called Flames of War, shows militants blowing up tanks and wounded U.S. soldiers. And it comes just one day after America's top general suggested the possibility of ground troops in Iraq. If we reach the point where I believe our advisors should accompany Iraq troops on attacks against specific ISIL targets, I'll recommend that to the president. For now, House lawmakers are on track to give President Obama authority to order U.S. military training and arms for rebels battling ISIS militants. That vote could come today. Meanwhile, the branches of al-Qaeda in Yemen and North Africa have put out a joint statement urging jihadists in Iraq and Syria to unite against the U.S. and coalition forces. ISIS is also using social media to encourage attacks here in America in places like New York's Times Square. ISIS creates a totally new area of threat for us. They are in also a position to inspire the increasing sophistication of their media outreach through the Internet, through all of the social media. And, Pat, the ISIS threat list includes other tourist locations like the Las Vegas Strip. Well, I, I just want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that we're talking now about arming Syrian rebels. I don't think at this point we understand who the good guys are or who the bad guys are. And we're liable to be helping. In the old days, it wasn't too many years ago, the uh, ISIS forces may have been the ones that we've been given money to who wouldn't have known any better. And I'm not sure in Syria, you know, I, I don't like the Assad regime necessarily, but he did keep a lid, lid on things. <clears throat> and now uh, it's chaos in that country. It's being um, partitioned, and somebody's got to go in and take charge of it. And I wouldn't be surprised if one day the Israelis weren't forced to go in for their own safety uh, to pretend, pre prevent this thing getting any worse. 
But we have to be very careful before we start voting hundreds of millions of dollars to some splinter group in Syria to say, well, all oh, of these are going to be the ones we will back. Uh, it doesn't work that way. John? Pat, Dr. Kent Brantley, the American missionary who recently recovered from Ebola, says the U.S. didn't act quickly enough to combat the disease. And other experts caution that if the deadly virus isn't stopped now, we could be fighting it for years. That warning comes as President Obama launches a major new effort against Ebola. Caitlin Burke has the story. It's an aggressive new effort to combat Ebola. People are literally dying in the streets. Now here's the hard truth. In West Africa, Ebola is now an epidemic uh, of the likes that we have not seen before. On Monday at the CDC headquarters in Atlanta, President Obama outlined the steps the U.S. will take in West Africa. They include a new command center in Liberia, an American general on the ground coordinating both U.S. and international relief efforts, and thousands of U.S. military personnel in Liberia to support the command center. Dr. Kent Brantley, an American survivor of Ebola, says the government's new call to action is coming dangerously delayed. Early on, he and other health officials pleaded for more resources in their fight against the virus, but they were ignored by the U.S. until Brantley and other infected Americans were sent home last month for treatment. On Tuesday, lawmakers held a hearing on Ebola. Experts from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention warned that if Ebola isn't stopped now, we could be dealing with it for years to come. And Dr. Brantley told senators that the deadly virus could spread like a wildfire. Indeed, it is a fire. It is a fire straight from the pit of hell. We cannot fool ourselves into thinking that the vast moat of the Atlantic Ocean will protect us from the flames of this fire. The World Health Organization says the window of opportunity to end the Ebola outbreak is closing. They predict the number of Ebola cases could start doubling every three weeks in West Africa and could cost nearly a billion dollars to contain. We must move quickly and immediately to deliver the promises that have been made and to be open to practical, innovative interventions. This is the only way to keep entire nations from being reduced to ashes. Caitlin Burke, CBN News. Quite a powerful advocate to fight the disease, Pat. Right from the pit of hell. I think that's a very eloquent statement. Once again, we're behind the curve. We came on it too late. It was already starting to spread before we do anything. I can't see what 3,000 American troops are going to do. They're not skilled uh, uh, epidemiologists. I mean, well, what are they? Why don't we send some doctors and nurses over there? And we need hazmat suits for them so they can deal with this thing safely. But uh, it only takes one little drop of this blood, only one little drop of the stuff. And, and, and if it ever gets airborne, w I mean, the, the world is in for a hellish nightmare. Uh, we just cannot emphasize enough how horrible it is. And, uh, you know, there was a book called The Hot Zone that talked about it. But once it starts spreading, I mean, it, it, is, it is deadly. And uh, it, I don't think it can be contained any longer. Liberia is just one small country. Then you've got Sierra Leone, you've got Guinea, you've got those other countries that are close by. Then you've got Ivory Coast, and then it just goes all the way over West Africa. And uh, they didn't know what to do with it. They don't bury the people properly. And, and anybody that's got the stuff, just a, just a little drop of blood, and you can get it. And uh, so I think we need to, if you want to spend money, let's spend money on laboratory science to see if we can't come up with some antidote um, to this dread uh, disease. They were working on something with those people down in Atlanta, but they ran out of this uh, special uh, treatment that they had for it. And the lab said, we don't have any more. Well, I think that's the place. If the government wants to do something, rather than sending troops to West Africa, let's send medicine and let's get labs going to come up with something that will kill that awful virus. John. Pat, a special congressional investigation into the Benghazi attacks begins with a public hearing today. The move by the House Select Committee comes two years after the attack that killed four Americans, including Ambassador Christopher Stevens. It is unclear if the investigation will deal with the big allegations that prompted the probe. The charge that U.S. forces were told not to respond to the attack with military force and if American officials lied about why the attack took place. The Obamacare website still has major security flaws that puts private information at risk. 
That warning comes from the Nonpartisan Government Accountability Office. More than 5 million Americans use healthcare.gov. The site collects their private information, like names, birth dates, and social security numbers. Investigators at the GAO uncovered more than 20 specific security flaws, and they say the Obama administration took a major risk by going live with the site last fall when the system was still not fully tested, and some of the testing on the website wasn't finished as recently as June. Pat? Uh, you know, I was talking to somebody who's knowledgeable about what goes on in Washington, and uh, the report, I, I mentioned the fact that a well-known lobbyist named Tommy Boggs had just recently died, and, and Patton Boggs was a big lobbyist. But the report that came to me is that Washington literally is in gridlock, that the whole government has, has, has shut down. Nobody's doing much of anything. We've got a president who doesn't know what he's doing. The policies are, are uh, obviously flawed. Instead of coming back and saying, look, we blew it, they, there's a tremendous amount of cover-up, obfuscation going on in Washington. And the Congress is, is in stalemate because there's such partisanship. No longer do people want to do what's good for America. They just want to do what's good for their specific brand of politics. They want to set up for the next election who we can beat and who we can not beat. Uh, Harry Reid has shut the Senate down. He doesn't let them take up any legislation whatsoever that might embarrass some of the members, so they don't vote on anything. Uh, the House is voting some stuff, but nevertheless, it doesn't go anywhere. And so the whole government that we've got, this huge, monstrous, expensive government, is just in, in, in a state of, uh, of gridlock. It's not moving. And uh, it's, it's, something's got to be done. And this, this president, instead of being America's uniter, he's America's divider. He does everything he can to set one class against another, to stir up animosity, to stir up racial strife, to stir up anything he can, to stir the pot, to get the, a crisis going so maybe that his party can win some, some electoral uh, votes. But he doesn't seem really to be engaged. And so the whole government is in trouble. I mean, that's the word I got, and I think it's a, it's a, a true story. The government is just now dysfunctional because the head of it is dysfunctional. John? Pat, America's waistlines have been expanding rapidly over the last decade. According to the Centers for Disease Control, 54% of U.S. adults have abdominal obesity, which is a waistline of 35 inches or more. And in the study's 12-year range, the average American male waistline grew by an inch to 40 inches. The average waist size for women grew 2 inches to 38 inches. People whose fat has settled mostly around their waistline instead of other places run a higher risk of heart disease, diabetes, and other issues related to obesity. And Pat, as we have reported here right before on CBN News, not all fat is created equal. Belly fat is the most dangerous place for fat to develop. <laughs> Absolutely. I feel like Paul Revere. The British are coming. The danger is coming. Not all fat is created equal. You Not heard it all. here. <laughs> all right. Well, we're going to hear how you got rid of a whole lot of yours climbing up that mountain. I'm looking forward to that. You got some video of my I have killers. some video. I took it on my cell phone. It came out really well, so oh, I'm wonderful. excited to show it okay. to you. Well, coming up, a place where kids eat ice cream all day and celebrate Christmas once a week. And they're tired of getting poked and prodded and so what we want to do is to give them a whole week where the answer to everything is yes. We'll visit the village where dreams come true for very sick children after this. Plus, you'll see one of my dreams come true at the top of Mount Kilimanjaro right after this. Oh, right. Well, we're almost to Mount Kilimanjaro, but before we bring these stunning pictures of Wendy at the summit, uh, it's one of the most painful experiences any family will ever know, caring for a child with a terminal disease. But a special vacation spot gives sick children and their families a haven of happiness during these tough times, a place where nobody ever says no, it's always yes. Angela Zapotec brings us this inspiring story from Celebration, Florida. A storybook resort not far from the Magic Kingdom in Orlando helps create magical moments for those in need of hope. Give Kids the World Village welcomes families with a child suffering from a life-threatening illness. 
For the families and kids that come to the resort, it offers them a retreat from their daily routines of hospital visits and medical treatments to what feels like a real life candy land complete with a gingerbread house located right behind me. Designed through the eyes of a child, the village makes young dreams come true. You can just see they're just so tired of the battle and they're tired of getting poked and prodded. And so what we want to do is give them a whole week where the answer to everything is yes. Imagine ice cream served from morning till night and Christmas every week, complete with snow and presents. As you walk through this whimsical world, the vibrant colors and sounds seem to create happiness and inspire hope. We work with 250 wish-granting organizations around the world, and so if a, if, a, if a child wants to come to Orlando and their wish is granted by a wish-granting organization, 50% of the kids do want to come to Orlando, and they call us and they, they come here for the vacation. The village was founded by Henry Landworth, a man who knows what it's like to be a child with stolen dreams. As a boy, he spent five years in Nazi concentration camps where his parents were killed. Though Landworth escaped, his childhood had vanished. Now 87 years old, he has dedicated his life to restoring stolen childhoods. In many cases, I see myself in this children's faces. Because when I was 13, I was taken to Auschwitz, which was one of the worst camps you could possibly be in. I had no idea that I would be living. I felt that I needed to do something. The village has helped more than 130,000 families from 72 different countries. Volunteers work year round. They come from churches, corporations, and special events like Hearts of Reality. Us here for a day has been great. You've seen those little kids smile and being a pirate for them, it's been fun. It's been very fun. I've had ovarian cancer twice, but thinking about having a disease or having an illness that is so restricting and you're, and you're a kid and your sister or brother's going through it or you're, you're seeing your child go through it, it's so different. Having something like Give Kids the World is allowing them not to think of their illness for a second. And they're allowed to think of being a kid and being a brother and being a mother and being a father in a family. Many families return to help spread the same hope and love that changed their lives. The Lohman family visited in 2009 with their three-year-old son, Noah. Noah was diagnosed before he was born uh, with a genetic disorder, and uh, we were given the option to uh, terminate at that point, which we didn't and didn't feel comfortable doing, thank goodness. After Noah passed away, they moved from their home in Canada to work at the village. From having Noah and, and just being blessed by him, and the joy that he brought to our lives. Although we miss him dearly, and, and we were obviously sad to not have him in our family any longer, the joy of having him and the joy of, of encouraging other families going through those tough times is something we wanted to share. And so what better way than to come to the place where we felt that from other volunteers and other families. Give Kids the World Village is still expanding, fulfilling its mission to bring love, laughter, and healing to children and their families. I just wanted to say thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you so much. Angela Zadipek, CBN News, Celebration, Florida. Now, if that wouldn't warm your heart, I don't know what would. It's tremendous. So sweet. And so now, sweet. <laughs> now, let's take a look. All right. Well, Are we I going to, to the summit? I got to tell you that hiking at elevation is the hardest thing I've ever, ever done, Pat. And we started in the rainforest at 6,000 feet and went up every day for several days in elevation. Let's take a look. Our journey on Kilimanjaro begins here in the oxygen rich rainforest, lush green and wet. We're in day two of our hike on Kilimanjaro, and uh, we're in the middle of a pretty steep climb here in the midst. And our uh, porters, who are with me, they're helping carry our stuff and uh, constantly reminding us at this elevation to go slowly, which in Swahili means. Well, it's now day three of our climb on Kilimanjaro. 
Kilimanjaro, and we can finally see our destination right there behind me, the peak of Kilimanjaro, 19,000 feet, snow in the clouds, can't wait to get up there. You know, it reminds me of Psalm 121. I will lift my eyes up to the hills from where comes my help. My help comes from God, the maker of heaven and earth. Onward we go. hike on Kilimanjaro and a beautiful sunny day. We're so happy about that. We're on our way up to Kosovo camp where we're going to have lunch, have a nice rest, and then at midnight we're taking off for the ultimate ascent up to the peak of Kilimanjaro known as Uhuru Peak. Poli Poli! Poli Hakuna Matata! Pat, wow. I couldn't film the night we were hiking on the summit. Oh, that was all man. night in the dark. I have to say, I got somewhere between 17 and 18,000 feet, and I started seeing people coming down the mountain, young people with oxygen masks. Yeah. And I got a little freaked out, a little nervous, and I just had to stop and pray. And uh, at that elevation, you know, every step, it's like turtle pace. Mm -hmm. and that's why they say go poly poly yeah. because you're at turtle pace. And I prayed, and I just said, Lord, what, do you, what should I do? Well, and yeah. God said, do not fear finish. And I, I, my Tanzanian guide, I have to give him yeah. a shout out, Moody. I wouldn't have made it without him, Pat. Well, did, did you have any oxygen at all? Something no like? oxygen. None? And did not take the, the Diamox, which is the elevation medicine that they, mm -hmm. uh, they pres you can, we took it with us just in case, but we decided well, not to take you it. You get disoriented, you get headaches, you get nausea. Did you have any of those things? Or all On the them? third day, the day that was really windy that you saw, yeah. uh -huh. uh, I had a a throw up migraine was throwing up and hiking all day and I thought if I can get through that then I'll be okay the next day I was better um, and everybody on the team w had a bad day you know mm -hmm. that's part of it you're, you're hiking yeah. for okay. so many days but my Tanzanian guide Moody he looked at me when I got scared on the mountain around 18,000 feet he said Wendy this is the point where most people turn around he said don't stop you're it's gonna get easier and when right. we got up to the top, it's flat. It's flat up on the mm -hmm. top, right. and it's 19,000 feet, but you can breathe just fine. It's the, it's the steep incline. Why that can makes you sense. breathe at 19,000 feet just fine? I don't know because we're not because you're not exerting yourself. Because at that point, mm -hmm. you're up on top, oh, yeah. literally on top of the world. It's the highest freestanding mountain in the world. Wow. But it was a thrill. And you know, seriously though, getting to the top. It's sort of anticlimactic because it's all about the journey. Yeah. It's all about the journey. And I just want to give a, um, a hello to all wow. my team members. They were uh, amazing right, and our uh, guides. Would you do it again? <laughs> I wouldn't do it right now. Um, I, need a, I need a break. Um, I love climbing. I love climbing. Okay. And, oh, and I want to show this scripture that was um, my Isaiah 40, verse 9. This kept going over and over in my mind. This was the scripture God gave me. Get up into the high mountain. Lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. This was what was going through my mind the entire hike up the, the mountain. It was um, the word of God. And knowing that you were praying, thank you well, so we much, sir. We were praying. My goodness and, um, gracious. Couldn't have done it without prayer, but it was an amazing You know, uh, I have to say, time. my son Gordon, we wanted to do this before and have a big deal of it. And Gordon said, I think Ann Curry of CBS, they started, uh, you know, having trouble. They, they, they had to, you know, get in an emergency to take them off the mountain. And she, he was afraid that would happen to you. Yeah, he was, Gordon, I'm alive, I made it. Thank you well, so much for letting me go. we didn't publicize <laughs> where you were going for your safety. Sure, so absolutely. Now that you're back, we can say with confidence. <gasps> yes. Check it off the bucket list. <laughs> don't do it again and do not try to. <laughs> Thank you so much. Don't try much. to <laughs> climb it was K2 thrill. or any of that stuff. I mean, enough. <laughs> no Everest. No, no Everest. Everest in the Please, future. Man. Thanks, All Pat. right. Well, it was a great accomplishment, and I'm, we're proud of you. That was extraordinary. Thank you. Whew. It was really an amazing I could time. not have done it, nor would I have had. There was a 72-year-old man on our team. You could have done it. I'm 84, yes. I'm not 72. <laughs> At 72, I could have done it. Now it's, it's too late. All he right. made it to the top. All Come right. on, what's next? Well, coming up, 
She was divorced and struggling as a single mom until she got a phone call. I put the phone on mute and I began to shout hallelujah. I was just screaming in the car, I had to pull the call. I was just so happy. Find out what made her so happy when we come back. To see this week's top on-demand videos, go to CBN.com. Well, welcome, folks. You're watching The 700 Club. Thank you for being with us. Not long ago, Letitia Thomas was living on unemployment, and she was buried by bills. And then Letitia made a decision, and suddenly her phone was ringing with job offers. Letitia Thomas loves her job serving as a manager for a healthcare company. What she loves even more is raising her five-year-old daughter. A few years ago, it was a different picture. Letitia was recently divorced, had lost her job, and was caring for her baby. Not very happy with myself at that time, and very unsure. Uh, but in the back of my mind, I just knew that God would provide. I just didn't know how. I was looking at my mess and said, God, how can you bless the situation? How can you help us here? And now, this is too much. This is too much. As Letitia scraped by on her savings and unemployment checks, the bills became unbearable. Um, food was uh, scarce in the house sometimes. We became best friends with a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. But even in her time of need, Letitia tithed faithfully to her church, something she had started months before. I've seen God work before. Why would I stop now? Whether I'm going to tithe from my wages or from uh, unemployment benefits or a random check in the mail, I'm going to give God what I said I would give Him. It came from something she learned at church. They taught a basic biblical principle about sowing and that God is really looking for your obedience. Not only that, Letitia decided to trust God and give more. Shortly after, her phone began to ring. Every time my phone would ring, it was a different job. It was a different employer saying, are you available for an interview? Letitia was offered a job. She was excited to get back to work, but soon she was ready for the next step. So she increased her giving again. One day, her supervisor came to her. She hands me a folded up sheet of paper with a job position. And I applied for it. And I thought that was kind of odd that my current supervisor was showing me another job. She came to me and she said, I believe in you and I believe that you have an abundant potential to do much more than you're doing right here. Look at this position and apply. Letitia applied for the job and three weeks later. I was driving to my daughter's school when I received a phone call and I answered the phone and it's the HR director from the dream job. He said, well, I don't want to take up much, or much more of your time, but I'd like to know if you could start this position in two weeks. I had to pull over. <laughs> I had to pull over. I was on the phone and he's like, are you there? Letitia, are you there? I'm like, yes. I said, can you give me a minute, please? I put the phone on mute and I began to shout hallelujah. I was just screaming in the car. I had to pull the car over. I was just so happy. With a new job, Letitia's salary had doubled. Today, she continues to give more and credits all her success to God's faithfulness. I had to do this. I didn't have any other resource. So I had to get to know God as my source. This is quoted all the time, Luke 6:38, give and it shall be given unto you in good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured back to you. I'm sitting here just saying, God has just been so faithful. I mean, really, I could have been anywhere else. It could have gone another way, it really could have. But God has just been so faithful. God is faithful. Ladies and gentlemen, we say it and say it and say it over again. Now, Jesus Christ gave us the principle in Luke chapter 6, where he said, give and it will be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Listen, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be peeped into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. God is faithful. He will not let you outgive him. 
And uh, so that's the principle of reciprocity. It works because it's in the Bible. It's the promise of God given us by the Lord Jesus Himself. Now, well, this is a special week. We want to ask you to consider helping us help others. And uh, CBN is reaching out into the four corners of the earth, feeding the poor, helping the sick, having hospital uh, missions, uh, leading millions of people to the Lord, proclaiming the good news of Jesus on every continent. And uh, you can do that by just saying, okay, pick up the phone. You can count on me as a 700 Club member. That's 65 cents a day. Some of you say, that's not enough. I want to double it. I'll do a uh, 700 Club Gold, or I want to do the 1,000 Club, or I want to do 2,500 or 5,000 or whatever. Uh, it's all there for you. But uh, now's the chance to do something. And for those who participate, we want to give you our gift called uh, Living Under God's Blessing. It's a team effort from me on one hand and Gordon on the other, and you'll enjoy getting that. So we'll send this up to you as a partner. So please call. It's 1-800-759-0700. And uh, we're going to see something great happen. This is going to be a tremendous year, uh, Wendy. It sure is. And as Pat just said, when you become a CBN partner, you are helping people all over the world. People like the men, women, and children who are currently suffering in Iraq under ISIS reign of terror. Take a look. As ISIS terrorism continues in Iraq, Tens of thousands of refugees have already fled their hometowns and cities, with more running from the threat of attacks every day. We were sleeping around noontime when mortar started falling all around us. We were afraid, so we prayed and then we left. Chamo is a recent Christian convert, so we're protecting his identity. He spent eight days trapped on Sinjar Mountain. He says he witnessed terrorists kill 170 Yazidi men and take their wives and daughters away to be sold were used as sex slaves. This former police officer took his family, including a newborn, to safety in Erbil after his city was seized. If we return to our village, they will kill us. All of these Iraqis and thousands like them found refuge in makeshift camps, schools, and abandoned office buildings. With scorching temperatures, medical emergencies, hard floors to sleep on, hungry babies, and dirty water, the living conditions are brutal. So CBN Disaster Relief partnered with Iraqi Christians and organizations to help. Operation Blessings' Brian Scott was on the ground in Zako, assessing the refugees' needs. Knowing that many Yazidis died on Mount Sinjar, um, lacking clean water, we have taken the initiative to bring water tanks to the Yazidi people so that they would have water on a daily basis in order to drink and survive. To combat a potential stomach virus outbreak, we provided a water filter system in Erbil. And we do these things in the name of Jesus Christ. In El Kosh, CBN provided mattresses, pillows, blankets, milk powder, and a refrigerator and freezer. This diabetic man was relieved because he had no refrigeration for his insulin and feared he would have a heart attack and die. I want to tell the Americans, thank you so much. CBN has given food, clothes, and medical aid to countless refugees, but thousands still wait in need. Some say they're ready to give up. They are crying, they are, we have to be like, uh, support them in this. We were encouraging him that the, the war doesn't end here because Jesus Christ has a plan for you, he loves you. That's the message we were able to share with over 100 refugee children when we showed them Superbook in their own Arabic language. It helped them to forget the sadness and terror that forced them from their homes and trust God. It's so good, and this film, it's so nice, and uh, Jesus is uh, with, him, with the, the children all the time. The Iraqi refugees' physical and spiritual needs are great. Chamo says he was attracted to Jesus because of the kindness and generosity of Christians, and asked that American Christians continue to help his people. We don't want to give our children and our women anymore. Please pray, pray for the Yazidis people so as to come to Christ just like me. Well, when you join the 700 Club, we'd like to encourage you to join via Pledge Express. 
This way, your bank does all the work, no checks, no stamps, no hassle. And during the month of September, if you become a Pledge Express member, we've got a special gift for you. It's a brand new CD from Pat called Psalms of Encouragement. It's something you can listen to throughout the day. It'll give you peace, joy, comfort, and strength. The Word of God is so powerful. Best of all, it's free. So if you sign up for Pledge Express, we're going to be sending you Psalms of Encouragement. You're going to love it. Pat? That's great. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, God is good. And it's a privilege, it's a thrill to be able to help people. It really is. To have enough funds to help people. And when all of us get together, we, we can see miracles happen. And uh, it's so simple. You, you know, in today's world, things are uh, so expensive. Uh, a bottle of soda pop used to be a nickel. Then it was a dime. Then it was 25 cents. Then it was 50 cents. Then 75. And now in some vending machines, it's a dollar and a half. You just never know, I mean, how much money. And a cup of coffee used to, you know, a cup of joe for a nickel. That was the old days. Now it's five bucks at a Starbucks. And so it's just, you know, it's crazy what people spend on uh, their own comfort. Well, it just takes 65 cents a day, and you can make a difference in the world. That's why we want you to join the 700 Club. Why don't you call right now? 1-800-759-0700. Now, we're going to meet a man who was once replaced by a karaoke machine. <laughs> Willie Jolly tells how a setback is a setup for a comeback. Oh, that's a nice introduction. <laughs> right after this, Wendy's going to talk to him. CBN presents Psalms of Encouragement. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Our gift to you when you join Pledge Express. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. A Satanic Temple is planning to hand out Satanic Children Activity Books to schools in Orange County, Florida. The group is distributing the material as a response to the school district, allowing a Christian group to leave Bibles, saying their whole point is to counter biblical indoctrination. A representative from Liberty Council calls the effort an attack. The Satanic group plans to publish material for high school kids as well. Egyptian Christians are calling on police in southern Egypt to find a kidnapped housewife. Hundreds demonstrated outside a police station in Minya province Wednesday, demanding they take action to locate a 37-year-old housewife who disappeared two weeks ago. Police arrested some 33 Christians after Molotov cocktails reportedly were thrown at the police station. Coptic Christians have complained about the number of kidnappings of Christian women by Muslim men. CBN News has reported on this disturbing trend and persecution of Christians in Egypt. You can find those stories and always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Wendy will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Welcome back. Willie Jolly was a jazz singer whose hot nightclub act played to sold out crowds. So Willie was shocked to find out he was being replaced by a karaoke machine. Take a look. We all have setbacks, even people known for their great achievements. Thomas Edison, Dr. Seuss, Walt Disney experienced failure before success. Motivational speaker and best-selling author, Dr. Willie Jolly says, obstacles are a part of success. In his book, A Setback is a Setup for a Comeback, Dr. Jolly shows you how to achieve success by embracing your setbacks. Well, please welcome to the 700 Club, Willie Jolly. It's so good to see you. It's good to see you. <laughs> it's always a pleasure. You look wonderful. Well, thank you and so much. That was a great piece about uh, Mount Kilimanjaro. Oh, thank you. Fantastic. Well, you know, hey, I read your book, so I was. Well, I, you know, <laughs> it's comeback time. That's right. You. Yeah. Well, good tell to us see you. how in the world you you were loving. I was a nightclub singer, got broke, replaced. busted, disgusted, and got fired and replaced by a karaoke machine, and was despondent. But, you know, I believe God is true. And I have read his word. And 
And his word says that all things work together for good for them that love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. And so I took a job with the school system while I was trying to figure out what I was going to do. And it was there I discovered an ability I didn't know I had to use words to communicate. And see, that's important. The school system was about the farthest from a nightclub singer yes. that you could do, but you took something that was available. Took something that was available and took an opportunity. Sometimes opportunities come and work close. Mm. Okay, uh, we sometimes have opportunity that come not in the way dressed in the way we expect them. And this was an opportunity. I started working with the school system and started giving little speeches from the from the kids and the schools. The teachers would say, can you come to my teachers association? And then someone at the teachers association would say, can you come to my church? And someone in the church would say, hey, I work for this company, that company. We need your kind of energy and your message. Can you come and speak for us? And then it grew. And then I got a little radio show. It got syndicated mm -hmm. and that led to television or to, a uh, number of television programs. And then a, a publisher called and said, have you ever thought about writing a book? And I said, no, I never thought about it. He said, let <laughs> me make you an offer. I said, I just thought about it. <laughs> what, Willie, so, what's the first thing someone should do if they've had a disappointment, a setback? What's the number one Number one, step? don't panic. Don't panic. Don't panic. You are not given a spirit of fear, but a power and love and a sound mind. When you panic, you cannot have a sound mind because you cannot think clearly. Panic is taken from the Greek word to choke. And when you panic, you choke off the air to your brain. So you must not panic. That's number one. Number two, you must have a vision. Start thinking about, well, if things were good and things were right, what would it look like? Because once you get a vision, Scripture says, without a vision, a people we'll perish. perish. But right. with a vision, a people will flourish. You have to have a vision. Mm -hmm. Then you got to make some tough decisions. You have to stay away from negative people and all the naysayers oh, yeah. and negative voices and all the bad news. Then you have to make another decision. This is critical. Do you see this as a setback period or mm -hmm. setback comma? Now, mm -hmm. when you were in elementary school, they taught you a period meant end of the sentence. Sure. No more to be said. But a comma pause, transition, mm. more to come. Third thing you must do is take action. You got to move on it. Faith without action right. is an illusion. And action without, without faith is mere for confusion. But vision and action put together can give your life a fair infusion. Willie, what did you learn in the process of making your comeback about the importance of inspiring people instead of impressing people. You know, I was, I was going to be a singer. I, might, you know, I was a singer, and I went to Nashville, Tennessee to sing at a big gospel music association conference, GMA. And I went there with this, with this arrogance, really, mm -hmm. that I was the new thing. I was going to be the next new gospel <laughs> artist. And, and I bombed. Really? And it was, uh, it was humiliating. And I went back to my little hotel room and cried out to God, what do you want? He said, don't try to impress them. Inspire them. Wow. And that, that message changed my life. And since that day, that's been over almost 30 years ago now, I've been trying to inspire people wherever I go, whether it's in music or on television or radio or speaking. Or wherever. companies like Ford Motor oh. Company. In 2006, they invited you to come and speak. And... You helped them out. Well, Ford Motor Company in 2006 was on the brink of bankruptcy, and they, they heard about my book, A Setback and Set Up for a Comeback. Someone called me from Ford and said, we need your help mm. to get 25,000 people to take a buyout. I said, well, I, I don't want to motivate them to take the buyout because I don't know their family situation, sure. but I can tell them about America. This is the greatest country the world has ever seen. And if you will believe in the possibilities, you can turn your life around. I worked with Ford 2006. 38,000 people took the buyout. 2007, I did television spots. 2008, I talked about creating world-class vehicles on a national tour for Ford. Because you got them to believe and, in their own possibilities beyond Ford. That's right. In 2009, yeah. Ford was the only one to reject the government bailout. And since then, they've gone on to billion-dollar profits. And the Detroit Free Press wrote a big article that I was a secret weapon to help Ford. <laughs> I don't know if it's true. I think that Ford folks just used someone who had an ability to help people think different. Sure. You know, that uh, this book, A Setback Set, of her comeback is, is built on one principle that all things work together for good for them that love the mm -hmm. Lord and I'll be called. You have to have faith to keep going. So what we do is we tell people that it's possible. And I want to encourage your viewers sure. to go to this website, jollygoodnews.org. Mm. We have a new faith-based website, jollygoodnews, J-O-L-L-E-Y, the E is for enthusiasm, goodnews.org, and get some free resources when I did the Hour of Power, some of the churches I've spoken at, some of the mo messages that will inspire them yeah. and that will lift their spirits. Because people just need to be encouraged. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, like you were saying, faith is such a key component of turning your setback into a comeback. Absolutely. Faith without faith, nothing is possible. With faith, all things are possible. are possible. And if you would just have faith, so when people go through the tough times, if they have faith, they don't panic and they have take action. All things are possible.
Well, it's a tremendous book, and it is called A Setback is a Setup for a Comeback, and it's available wherever books are sold. Willie, you're amazing. I'm and grateful. Thank you That's so what much. I am. God bless you. It's so good to be here. Good to see you. God bless you. Todd. Man, if he can turn around Ford, think about that. Mullally shouldn't get all the credit. Willie should. Well, coming up next, we're going to bring it on with your email. Debbie says, someone asked me, since the Bible was written by man, how do we now know it really is what happened long ago? Well, he said, please explain it better than I do. I'll do my best. Coming up. I'm going back to school for my second degree, a Master's of Business Administration. Regent is definitely helping me on my path by giving me all of the tools and resources that I need to be successful in my career. The colleagues that I go to school here with and the professors all believe and share the same values that I do. The goal for me going to school is to set a strong foundation, not only within my career, but also in my family, and I set a good example in the community. Regent University, follow your path. Hey, by, by the way, Regent is tremendous. Uh, last night, we had Justice Antonin Scalia uh, and many, many members of the judiciary from the local area and from Virginia, and uh, Judge, uh, District Judge uh, uh, Hudson, Henry Hudson was here. It was a tremendous meeting, 700 people. I mean, mm -hmm. Judge Scalia, they treated like a rock star. People were just clamoring to get to hear him. He was fun. Wow, well, the judges, when they speak, people listen. Well, they, this guy particularly, yeah. but anyhow, that's part of Regent and Regent Law School and Regent University. It's one of the great law schools in the country. And uh, we have had three Supreme Court judges, Judges Thomas and uh, Scalia and uh, Alito have been here. And uh, it's really nice. Okay. But we got some great questions. Go uh, Deidre writes in, someone asked me, since the Bible was written by man, how do I know that it is really what happened long ago? How do I know that the quotes in red were really said by God or Jesus? My response was that it was a matter of faith and, and belief. Please well, explain. The, the Bible says about itself that so all scripture, uh, the Greek is pasegraphe, all the writings are Theomnistos, it's a nice word in Greek. It means God breathed. Everything is God breathed. And the, the holy men of God writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, this book has been vetted over and over again. And we go almost back to the days of the apostles. We don't have what is called the autographs. But these are the writings. Now, as far as the Old Testament, that, listen, if a scribe, Jewish scribe writing down, if he counts the number of consonants, and after he, he may have written half of the manuscript, and if one consonant is off from the count, he tears mm. the whole thing up. He's got to destroy it. He can't, he can't keep it. So it is absolutely perfect, the writing that has come, and it has come through generations and generations and generations. And it has borne the, the imprimatur of the Holy Spirit. As far as the New Testament, the same thing. It has gone through church councils. It has gone through others to get what seemed to be the closest to the writings of the Lord. And the Bible says it's God-breathed, and I believe it. Well, we leave you with today's Power Minute from Proverbs 3. Hear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.